Hello, Anne Marie. Can you hear us? Hello. I can. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Hiya. for thanks for joining. Hello, everybody. Um, sorry that we are a couple of minutes late getting started today, and thank you very much for jo joining us. Um, Anne Marie, are you happy if I just kick off and provide a quick introduction to you before we start the session? Yeah, today? no problem. That's fine. Perfect. Thank you. So, hello, everybody, and welcome to the BSAB British Schools in the Middle East webinar series. My name is Ashley Whitefoot, and I'm the professional learning coordinator here at BSME. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day today to join us on our first webinar back this year on safeguarding. The session is being recorded and will be available through our website, bsme.org.uk. Before we start, if I could just direct your attention to the chat pod, this is the white box in the lower right hand corner of your screen. You will notice that your microphones are muted um, and they will remain muted throughout the session. So any thoughts, comments or questions that you have can be written here. To test that you can hear me and that the chat function is working as it should, please use the pod now just to make a comment, perhaps say good morning or where you're listening from. And once we've got a few comments, so I know it's working okay, we can make a start. Oh, perfect. Good morning. Hi. Oh, hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so it looks like we're ready to go. Today's safeguarding <laughs> webinar will be delivered by Anne-Marie Christian. I hope you find it useful. Anne-Marie, over to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm currently also just doing some DSL training to another kind of group in the, um, the Middle East. So hence, I'm just, you know, just joined in now. So um, yes, for my 30 minute talk this morning, I'm talking to you about updates. So my background, I'm a social worker of 25 years um, in child protection, managed social work teams. Um, I've been working internationally since 2008, um, Middle East, Dubai, actually my first country. And I've worked in other countries around the world. I work for um, quite a few um, organizations, the Council of International Schools, the NSPCC, the Bordesville Association, and quite a lot of others in the sense of associate work. So I'm very familiar with safeguarding internationally. Um, and also in the UK, we are kind of um, doing quite a lot of proactive work with safeguarding. And my kind of discussion with you this morning is to um, give you an update on um, what's happening. So in, in the world of my international safeguarding, I am aware that we have um, Australia are ahead. They are definitely ahead of us in, in the sense of being very proactive in talking about the reality of, of harm being done to others by others, including their peers as well. Um, and the education of it, the teaching of it. And in the UK, we're just behind them. So we're behind them in the sense of um, understanding it. So the government have committed to and, you know, the of the regulated bodies who do child protection in the sense of um, school teaching and requirements of um, the duties of care is also done in that sense as well. And um, again, it's just my talk to you today is, is just giving you an update in the reality of what we discovered last year um, in, or this year, should I say, in, in, in you know, child and harm, peer and peer harm being done. So some of you might have heard clippets of it um, in, in where you're based, and I'm just going to give you the overview um, of it. So um, in, in the UK, for example, we've got this guidance here. Some of you might be aware of it. It was just um, um, updated literally the 1st of September. And in this guidance, it's quite thick. It's a requirement um, in, in, in the law of the land that says that everyone who works in a school or college have to have, um, you know, have read part one of this guidance about safeguarding. And they've just amended it in, in line with um, what we know about everyone's invited. So in this kind of conversation today, I will be talking to you about, you know, what really is going on and what does it mean for you in your setting. So my starting line normally internationally is um, a potentially, you know, just health warning for us ourselves as human beings. So I find that in some places um, it's quite taboo to talk about harm being done in the sense of the reality of abuse. So, you know, just looking after yourself and hearing me today, please. Um, if something does come up for you, please seek support by, you know, um, a, a helpline or, a, you know, your HR department who can support your well-being. So, um, yes, um, it's just, I suppose, me talking to you in the 30 minutes. So I know your end, Ashley, are you in control of the slides? Or am I doing it my end? I don't know how I can navigate them. Ashley? Yes, I can do it for you. If you just say next, I'm happy to pop onto the next slide for Thank you. Thank you. I think I can, let me see. I'll try it this end, hold on. Oh yeah, 
I see it. I see the arrow now. Sorry. I see this end. So this is our health warning in us um, keeping yourself safe. So safeguarding is an emotive subject. So please, colleagues, just in your hearing this, just be mindful of um, the reality of ourselves, too. And again, just be mindful, you know, in, in our ground rules here that diversity is part of every day. So we have to remember with culture, there's going to be some children who um, have been experienced harm being done, but are unable to say anything because of the nature of what families or cultures or generally conversations that aren't being said yet. So again, we've got UNICEF rights to the child, but we have to be mindful that for some children, it's still very difficult to actually raise a, a concern, especially when um, no one talks about, you know, sexual sexual activities or any type of harm being done. Um, so we're just going to have the overview. And the overview, um, we had a documentary a few years ago in the UK, which kind of brought the subject up first for the public in that sense. So throughout my career, I've always had those scenarios of children who've been harmed by others, but it's nothing you know, known outside of that forum of children's services, I suppose. We just take for granted that children are harmed by people rather than their peers. So this came out, and again, what the government did a month after they kind of um did something where they got some guidance for schools and colleges so again it's on the .gov uk website colleagues but it's a really good thing where potentially we recognize that you know the research is telling us that children are being harmed by their peers and there are lots of incidents happening in school and outside of school that um, young people are experiencing and um, we need to educate them, but also raise the awareness. So the guidance, as you can see, has been revised three times. Um, so there is a requirement now in recognising how we need to enable young people to inform us. Um, but we're going to learn today, just briefly now, the barriers there are for young people and why they can't. So this is something we already know, hence prior to the um, big kind of campaign that was at the start of this year. But in schools and colleges, we've always known that, you know, there are, are incidents. And sometimes these two young people who've been involved in this incident also <clears throat> may come to the same setting. They might be in the same school. They might be in a place where actually um, they can't sell anyone. Or how do you as a school deal with that? The fact there is, do you separate? Do you, do you exclude? So it's just something to be thinking of in my conversation today. But these are available on the .gov UK website. If you're finding it difficult, then I can send it over to Ashley again, who could share out this guidance for you. Um, this is the definition, colleagues, of um, harm, you know, harmful sexual behaviour. So I'm sure you all know, as you know, safeguarding colleagues, um, that we know about the four categories of harm, of abuse. Um, physical, emotional, neglect, and sexual. I normally reference that as PEND. It's an easy acronym to remember. And again, UNICEF rights to the child. And again, um, in, in lots of governments around the world, they've actually brought in some protection. So most countries have got a law in keeping children, hence protecting children. Um, in some countries, they're a bit more advanced than others in how it looks on the ground, in the operational, in policies and in settings. In some settings, it's just the top end of um, reactive. And some countries, it's a police matter. Some countries, it's children's services. And in some countries, it's just actually an in-house in the sense of there's no re requirement or recognition. So again, in your countries, just be aware of what that will look like in the reporting mechanism, okay? Because sometimes, for example, if it's an image in the sense of harm being done, you know, indecent image, does that mean it's it's illegal, which means it's a law? And again, I appreciate some colleagues might want to have a conversation with family and, and young person rather than bringing the police. So it's just something, again, for you to be considering in your role. So this is a definition, colleagues, and I just want to emphasize here that it does say, um, you know, a behavior that which is inappropriate, um, the word being developmentally inappropriate. So I suppose as we've got a chat and I'm aware of a time, you know, when would it be what would be an appropriate um, developmental touch for a child? So in touching and children, again, in your chat here, um, anyone want to just comment or say about when 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 it would a touch to a child to themselves or to another person be seen as appropriate colleagues so just a, one or two comments just so i can get some conversation going here 
So anyone just going to give an example or when it would be appropriate for a hence it would be it would be harmless behavior. When would it be a harmless behavior during playground? Thank you. Um, any other ones? I'll just take someone is typing. High five. Thank you. So exactly. We've got those games which we already know, whether it's had, whether it's um, some people used to do kiss chase, whether it's um, a game um, of hugging and all those scenarios. So there will be times when, of course, you're going to, you know, invade the personal space of an individual or a child in a PE lesson where you've got to be close to people. Um, so we've just got to be mindful. It might be accidental because the child's run into somebody else. So these are all things we need to consider in the, the thin line between that's actually appropriate. I can see that. Or actually, was it done deliberately? So we're going to talk a bit more about this in the sense of what it looks like. Um, and in, in talking to you about everyone's invited in, in what we know. So in giving you an update on this theme, um, it was a young girl called Soma Sara. Um, she watched, um, a, a, you know, a, a you know, this series, I May Destroy You, which talks about, you know, um, on, you know, rape culture, just generally, you know, misogyny generally within society or life, etc. And um, she went online and had a bit of a, you know, a, a groan about it in the sense of she's not happy about it. And it's not, you know, it should be challenged. And then she spoke to her grandmother, who's a campaignist, who almost kind of also said to her, you know, we just um, need to do something and go ahead and try. So she started online. Um, and with Sarah Everard, there was a murder in the UK of a young girl who was murdered by um, a male. Um, and um, again, it was this whole thing about, you know, this girl's got, why did she kill? She was also, you know, assaulted in other ways. And it's a thing about actually she should be free to do what she wants to do as a you know, person. And it really brought in young people. So from June 2010, they published the testimonies that happened and children were talking about sexual violence and sexual harassment being done in schools. So that's what happened within the UK from March till June. And it really, Ofsted got involved. So our, you know, Department of Education got involved from the government purposes and said, what is going on here? You know, we need to look at it in more detail. And, and, and that's what they did. So they, they, they published a paper on in June. And in this paper, they spoke to 900 children over in, in 32 schools. And in my international work, I know for a fact that in every school I've been to, there have been incidents of peer on peer harm. So even I'm telling you from the British context, please remember, it also happens internationally. OK, so this is something where we have to be aware of the research is telling us and, and the young people are telling us it's happening. OK, so this is what the young people have told us in, in what we've done here in the UK. Um, they're saying that they have been exposed to harmful content on a daily basis. They have been asked to send things or, you know, generally shared things that they don't want to necessarily see. They've been called names, derogatory names. Um, so here you can see an example of the volumes of what the young people are saying in how often it happens. Um, and how, you know, how it's so normal they don't respond. So I've done quite a few post-police investigations when a school has had these incidents of harm being done to another child by a child, um, normally someone they know. And it's come to the attention of the school and the school got the police involved and the police has said there's no evidence, so we can't do anything. And the school's gone back to say, right, has this person, the child, breached our policy? Have they breached our child protection policy or a behaviour policy? And in interviewing young people, um, they're telling us why it's difficult to say. Um, so this information that we've got from the Ofsted review, they recognise that we need to have a it is happening here approach. We need to have an approach where if we accept it's happening, then we can support young people in how they can tell us in a very discreet manner where they're not in trouble or potentially getting their friends into trouble. So again, um, the young people in the conversations that were done via the you know, recent Ofsted investigation, they were talking about it happens in unsupervised spaces. So unsupervised spaces is things like um, every setting would have blind spots. Every setting would have areas where young people go, which isn't supervised appropriately because people know they shouldn't go there. Unsupervised spaces might be the minibus. So when you go on trips, for example, you know, young people have told me in an interview that 
when they go on the bus, the person who's doing them or targeting them sits next to them and it continues on the bus. It continues when they go on the trip. It continues in class, under desks, in people, you know, but it's very discreet. So they're saying it's happening. So what are we doing to create a conversation where young people feel comfortable telling someone without getting their friend into trouble? They also talk about it, play dates, cinemas. It happens in the shopping malls. It happens outside, but with their peers, including people they know. And I'm emphasizing that because some children think peer on peer is just people around me rather than my friends. So when you are talking about it with your students, please just be mindful of introducing the concept of also people you know. And that's when they question, wow, you know, I might be doing things because they're my friend, but actually recognizing it. How did this happen? Have I been coerced into doing something? They speak about it in school as well. So um, Carleen Furman, who was the originator of understanding contextual safeguarding and peer-on-peer -peer harm, she did say that in 2017 with her first research um, that schools, especially secondary schools, they are a recruitment ground for peer-on-peer -peer harm, for exploitation because of puberty, curiosity, peer pressure and all those other things. And again, consistently across the world in every country I've been to, and I've been to quite a few of the countries that are here today, um, there are these things happening in the conversations that I have with schools. So if you haven't been told about it, it doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means they're not telling us. Again, in our local areas um, and in our corridors. So just be aware of that, colleagues, it is happening. So we call, talk about the living experience of children a living experience. So this also was highlighted of why they're not talking. Um, the one that gets to me the biggest on this particular slide is getting peers into trouble, it's not worth it. So it's not worth losing their friendship. So they almost divide the behaviour. So they'll say, this is my friend. I like them most of the time, but I just don't like it when that happened or when this happened. So they can divide it to say 90% of the time, they're my friend, it's a good time. But 10% of the time, or when it happens, I don't like it. And that's a really big thing that we're hearing in dividing that or part of a friend of a friend. So whether, you know, it's a request being sent and they ignore it and the person pursues them, we've just got to be aware of the pressure young people are in, in talking about it to somebody. We know the snitching culture, okay? We just need that child to have a conversation to talk about how it impacts on them or how they feel about it. So these are the barriers of what young people are saying. They're worried how we are going to react. They feel powerless because does that mean you've got to tell my parent? Does that mean I'm going to get into trouble or my friend is going to get into trouble? Or not being believed, you know, people thinking they're exaggerating it. So these are really key messages, colleagues. That I really want you to actually grasp in um, understanding what would it mean for us to create a proactive approach in young people knowing we understand their living experiences and there's no embarrassment in this, there's no awkwardness in this, and actually we're here to advise and support you on that. So that's the starting point in me kind of updating you in what we are currently doing now here in this kind of new academic year. So the guidance I've showed you, keeping children safe, there's lots in there about peer-on-peer -peer harm, reporting, young people's understandings, et cetera, that has to be put in our policies and in our practice. So for example, staff are going to be trained up on peer-on-peer -peer harm of how it looks in front of them in the classroom or in school, for example. So with the guidance that happened, again, I'm just sharing this for good practice, obviously. Um, we have got an um, RSHE curriculum at the moment we're working on, and in that we'll be teaching about consent the whole thing about healthy relationships, unhealthy friendship groups, et cetera. Um, and also our settings now have to consider how are we recording lower level behaviours? So going back to my comment about appropriate touching, we know that children go through puberty. They're, when they're young, they go for a phallic stage of touching their bodies. The thin line between when you do it to somebody else, is that harmful or is that curiosity? Um, and again, as they get older, you know, we know about touching themselves again inappropriately in this, or actually are they exploring their bodies through developmental touch, hence children going through masturbation of that stage of, you know, curiosity touch on self. So we just got to be aware, colleagues, that 
it is a reality of children's body changes of puberty. And we just got to be aware that with learning that some of those behaviours, unfortunately, when it comes to invading people's spaces and touch is actually something happening. So what are we doing to actually educate or raise the awareness and, and, and get people to start reporting? So it's just important that we think about our recording, whether you're using online software, of how we capturing a, a teacher or person telling us we are concerned about this person's inappropriate behavior towards or they touch them or this and that. So we've just got to be creating chronologies of harmful behavior. So an example we're doing at the moment is harmful behavior you're recording. Was it physical, emotional, neglect or sexual? And was it a behavior? Was it language? What was it? Was it in coursework? So it's how we capture all the little detail that tells us more about that young person. Some people express it through their artwork or in their stories or poetry. So we've just got to be aware of concern and how we report it to our safeguarding lead. Again, we're going to go down the route of behavioural approach to sanctioning rather than it being punitive. So how can we correct certain behaviours rather than, you know, being punished for that and, and educating young people? We're also thinking about an understanding that safeguarding leads clearly need specific training about peer-on-peer -peer harm and also all the school, school staff, including governors. Um, in the UK, we've got quite a lot going on with our government in, in online safety bill, for example, in recognising the, the ownership and responsibilities to a lot of organisations and platforms, but also how we can try and make it more difficult for young people to um, go online and be exposed to harmful content. But also we're upskilling our regulated bodies about how they look into complaints about peer on peer harm. We all, the guidance has been has, has come out. It came out in um, in September about sexual harm. So this was revised just literally um, last week. And again, they're going to be kind of a, a big program. And also children are going to be given guidance about peer on peer harm. So at the moment, children have got this keeping children safe children's version that we give them, that they're aware of their rights to be safe. And they're going to revise that based on peer on peer harm. So for you, it's just you doing some work and recognising colleagues, what is a healthy, um, what would be an appropriate behaviour of a child doing something curiously? And, and it will be definitely what's on here about exploring, you know, it being mutual, et cetera. And then when does it become problematic in that sense of, um, you know, inappropriate to the sense of, you know, spontaneous, but also on more than one occasion? Um, lack of understanding or her lack of empathy and all the other things that go with that or the fact they're not aware they're making other people uncomfortable with what they're doing. And also clearly problematic is when there's aggression, there's fear, there's potential violence and not appropriate to the child's development as well. So we just got to be aware again of when the child blames others for it and all the other things. So we just got to be aware of this in how we tackle and understand what can we do to support young people. So this is a model that we're using, um, Hackett 2014, and we've got this consistently through. Some people use the the, um, the, the traffic toolkit um, from Brooks or the AIM projects, but this is something that we're kind of trying to endorse across our settings where we remind people about what is appropriate behavior, when it becomes inappropriate, and when it might be problematic. So when we hear about inappropriate behaviours, we correct those behaviours back to appropriate behaviours. But if we don't, as you can see, it escalates quite quickly to something we, we can't control. So we just got to be aware. And, and the next slide just highlights again for us in the guidance and the definition. You know, the definition of child sexual abuse is someone who's forcing or enticing a child to take part in activities. The blue box here with activity explains that some of that activity might be um, curious, you know, naturally developmentally appropriate, you know, a child kissing a person, maybe touching themselves, um, you know, a child rubbing themselves again, but also um, if somebody wants or is curious about their body and takes a picture of their body, you know, that could be curious rather than it being done deliberately. Hence, the child, you know, doesn't know what their body looks like and, and wants to see. Is that now a decent image that they've taken a picture of their body? So that's when it will be questionable. But what do we do with that? We also know that harassment would be a child who's been asked, someone asking a request, asking a child to share an image of themselves or receiving it is definitely under the category of unwanted conduct of a nature, including online. And clearly, we know there's certain games that they play sometimes when there is intentions behind deliberate touch um, in, in whether it's touching genitals or touching body. It's a game. Um, but when it invades their personal space and their genital area, 
um, there's quite a lot of playground games, um, which on, on a bigger kind of conversation you would you, you hear of, whether it's, um, you know, the one called ball tapping. There's quite a lot of few playground games or games against peers that they play, which is a bit of fun, a bit of banter. We just got to be mindful of, you know, the ones I've looked into and investigated um, post police have been ones where clearly it was more than that. It was actually groping and assault. It was a sexual assault or sexual violence. So clearly consent is a big part of this. But again, we've got to consider culturally what that would mean in the sense of does that exist in the sense of their children and actually they can't consent. So I'm only giving you things to think about in my conversation today. Hence, it's a very brief um overview. So on my last slide, we'll do questions. I've got a minute for questions. From what we're learning is we do have to educate parents. We do have to have a whole school approach to recognising harm being done by other peers and recognise it happens online too. Even people I know do it and peer on peer in the sense of friends. So we just got to introduce it to children. It also means their own people as well. Recognising cultural difference, recognising taboo subjects for some people, how difficult it is to talk about that with the setting, meaning are you going to tell my parent at what point do you have to get other people involved? So we just got to do that very sensitively where the children can tell us. Recognising again in your setting where the blind spots are, and also the language you're using. So when I talk about harmful behaviours or talk about culture, so this is something where, again, um, Janine Saunders done a very good um, early warning sign, but she's also done one in Arabic. She's got them in different languages on her website. She's got a website. It's um, the letter E, the number two, the letter E publishing. She's got downloadable resources on there that you can use in your setting to raise a profile of young people talking about harm or when they feel scared. Likewise, she's done some work with teenagers in India recently where she's got posters about coercive relationships or friendship groups that are that as well. So we really need to be raising the awareness to our young people about recognising across the school one language, harmful behaviours, feeling uncomfortable, someone's making you feel nervous or intimidating you, pursuing you, all those things that they should be able to tell us because we already know it's happening. And us questioning. So young people might see it as acceptable, but clearly we know it's um, harmful. So we just need to create a culture where we can have that conversation. So I've got one minute for our questions. So any questions from my kind of overview in our introduction here? Just so um, I know it's short and sharp and it's quite intense, but um, from you hearing it from your perspective from being in the Middle East, any questions that you have? or queries in our a minute that we have left? And what does this mean for you? Policy, practice, or whether, does it mean you want another follow-up in the sense of um, putting this into practice in, in your settings? What do we need to put in as a toolkit, potentially? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, very good point there. You know, my first opening line is um, child abuse does not discriminate. So I, I will say that in my in my opening line, whatever country I'm in, because it's almost like it's happening. It can happen anywhere. And the research is telling us it's international rather than one place, not the other. So recognizing that by teaching and bringing in the rights of the child, hence UNICEF rights of the child, um, we are doing it as empowering children to know they've got a right to be safe, the right to be heard, believed as well. So that's the first thing we do internally through our curriculums that we have. Secondly, it's introducing it to effective parents in our communities where as a school, we've got a duty of care to support you in keeping your child safe and promote their well-being. So you're introducing, I've got a duty to support you in keeping your child, a child, innocent, but also helping them to you know, become a successful adult in protecting them from harm. So the more we start introducing it as a conversation in that concept, the more parents get used to um, recognising they have got to know and be more involved in their child's life, hence online. Hence, I do trust people, but I have to appreciate there's people who might know my child who might do horrible things to them. So we have to start, obviously start slowly in the conversation in recognising and maybe referring to other places in the world where we're learning this as new research. Um, and what does it mean for us? Are we having conversations with our children to see how they're feeling? Have we recognised the change in our behaviour? 
again, on your website, having a, a, an email address or a, a, a phone number or a, a page where you can signpost people. So every country has a child protection helpline um, given by whether a non-government organisation or actually by the um, government. So there is actually, you, you know, NGOs in every country, but also there are again, um, organisations raising the profiles of child abuse uh, in every country. So it's just what are we doing to try and bring some of that onto our platform to introduce it to parents? And then as a school, we embed that in our policy, embed it in our behaviour policy, do your questionnaires with students around how they feel safe, including people they know online as well. And again, just getting parents to kind of be more kind of working with us in their children's lifestyle generally. So I hope that answered your question, but it's just a starting point is um, it, it will take time. It, you know, it's just changing your website, having that wording, your pro prospectuses, your conversations at parents evening, your general conversation as a leadership group with the school, with your staff. There's lots to do. You know, the community, um, working with your local faith group, all of those things are really important in a joint approach to safeguarding. OK. I hope that answered your question. And if you've got any more questions, again, you could email Ashley um, and then she can send them over to me and I can help you and sub sign post you and reply. Yes, okay. thank you so much, um, Anne-Marie. And I'm aware she has to shoot off, so we will call it there. But no thank problem. you on behalf of BSME for a really informative session. And thank you to everybody who joined today for your time and participation. I hope you're able to take something away from this. Anne-Marie, <laughs> it's no all right, problem. we'll let you go now. Thank you. Have a good <laughs> afternoon. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Bye -bye. As mentioned at the start, um, this session was recorded and you will receive an email afterwards with a link to watch it back. If you'd like to view any of our previous webinars, please do visit our website at bsme.org.uk where you can browse and sign up for future events too. I'll also be sending around a PDF version of these slides today and I'll also include Anne-Marie's contact details should you have any further questions for her. Once again, thank you very much everybody and please do enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.